I'm Scott Fondas, the chief film critic for Variety. We're here with Michael Mann uh, to talk about his debut feature, Thief. Uh, I thought it could be interesting, Michael, to uh, talk a little bit about um, your attraction to the, the subject matter of the film, because you've made many films over your career dealing with career criminals and the law enforcement officers who pursue them. First of all, I grew up in inner city Chicago. And people like the people in Thief were part of the milieu that you grew up within. I mean, it was part of the urban landscape, part of the urban kind of mythology of power as it worked in that city. There's a certain cynicism about institutions. That distresses me, Your Honor, because this man is a reformed character, advanced age, and suffers from a severe heart condition and may not be able to serve out his sentence. Knowing him as I do, has spent over 21 years of incarceration, has become a different person. I don't know. I remain unconvinced. So is this something I grew up kind of within? That's number one. Secondly, when I first got interested in, in uh, making film, and first got interested in things visual, I was... I was probably uh, in my late, late teens, early 20s, and I would take pictures of certain bridges, the way they would present themselves at dusk. I was experiencing something transcendent in the moment, and, and I was feeling the impulse of conveying that without knowing then that I wanted to make films and, and that, you know, that, these, that these should be locations. You know, it was, it was feeling an experience and wanting to package it. So I felt that way about lots of parts of downtown Chicago, about the alleys behind Wabash, and uh, you know the way those steel firescapes presented themselves against the night sky, how shiny the streets are when it's raining. So all these images were, were stored as, as things that I wanted to. Uh, then I became inter interested in making film, became a filmmaker. But the way they really collide was that I came to view Frank as a, kind of a rat in the maze, but it's a three-dimensional maze of city, and that he's with, within a construction to achieve what he wants to achieve, to get what he's defined for himself, that he wants in his life. And the city becomes three-dimensional when there's a lid on it, and the lid is night. So as soon as you, as soon as you, as soon as it's night in the city, there is a roof, okay? And I particularly avoided seeing the tops of buildings. So you always felt that we were within it. So that's why I wanted to make avenues and the kind of perspective that lights make when they're both reflected on the pavement and they're also in the sky or they're reflected on a black paint of his car. It's always to feel like you're in a tunnel. I was not natively visual. I was not a visual artist as a, as a kid. I had no interest in cameras or anything. And so I had to acquire some skill sets. So I looked at Pizarro only for perspective, not for the mood. Were you thinking about film noirs at all, which also often have that kind of quality of the, the city as a sort of claustrophobic uh, prison for the characters? I wasn't, I wasn't thinking consciously about film noir at all. And I think in true film noir, there really is a, uh, a sense of hopelessness, a sense of ennui. It's the same events of the horrors of World War II that produce existentialism beginning with the, with the thought of why should I not commit suicide? How do you process the, uh, the, the scale of industrial murder in World War II? And uh, that's not Thief. Thief doesn't have those kind of things. Talk a little bit more about the character of Frank. Yeah. There's a novel that's credited as based on the home invaders right. by yeah. Frank Hoheimer. Who was he, and how much of that novel is actually Frank Holmheimer? In the film? Frank Holmheimer was was a thief and a home invader, and I got interested in his book and then discarded all of it. Okay, <laughs> but I had a history of having had a negotiation and a history and with a title, so then I I was compelled to say it was based on it. So I I discarded the book. And Frank's character became a work of fiction, not really based on anything, but informed by the attitudes of some, a number of thieves I knew, uh, two of whom were in the film. One is John Santucci. I'm here to make life easy for you. 
Yeah, smooth out the bumps and the humps. So all the methods mm -hmm. and the kinds of robberies that Frank does are the methods, robberies, and in fact, tools of John Santucci. So we went to John Santucci's drop, got all his work tools, and those, those were our props. So everything was real and everything we did was real. There's another guy there uh, who also had, in terms of attitudes, a guy named W.R. Uh, Brown. Who, was, who plays Mitch, Leo's sidekick. He was still on the FBI's most wanted list as of two years ago. And, uh, and he, he, was a, he was a good thief. <clears throat> was the character, Frank, or the script in general, uh, informed at all by the time that you had spent at Folsom Prison when you were making your previous film for television, yeah. Jericho Mine? Very much so. I didn't really have any sense of what prison life was until I spent time uh, when I was writing Straight Time. So I wrote one of the drafts of Straight Time when Dustin was going to direct it, and he started directing it in Folsom. I wrote that draft. Then Dustin decided he couldn't direct it, and then the picture took a different course with a different director and moved away from the screenplay I wrote. And then I went back to Folsom uh, and spent a lot of time there and a lot of time talking to a lot of convicts. I had 28 convicts in major speaking parts in Jericho Mile. And I really got that sense. I really could imagine what prison was. And then, it, and then I tried to imagine what it would be if you, were, if you were in prison from about 18 or 19 years old to when you're in your 30s and, uh, and you get out. And what state of mind are you in? What, what have you missed? You don't know how payphones work. You don't know how to say hello to a girl necessarily. You don't know what kind of music people are listening to. You really have had a lot of formative years, um, you know, at, at one remove from society, from culture, from everything that we take for granted. If you're living in Los Angeles and you go away for three and a half months like I just did and you come back, it's like everything is different, you know. How does Frank take in and how does he um, design what his life ought to be while he's in prison, anticipating getting out? And um, there's a certain mechanical uh, approach that he has to it, which, which is all he has. He has magazines. When he's removed from the fact and experience of life and uh, has to model it somehow. And it had a wonderful kind of a, kind of a wild child um, parallax view on our, you know, when he's putting it together, this ersatz kind of collage on a postcard. I hoped it displayed what the inner dynamics are of our lives as we live them. And there's so much emphasis in the movie on, on process, and there's the right. famous story that when, when Eric von Stroheim starred in Sunset Boulevard, he insisted to have a real a real Leica camera rather than a prop camera right. because he said the audience knows the difference if it's yeah. real or it's fake and and I, I'm wondering if, you know if 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 you're kind of simpatico to that, totally, that view. Totally, totally, because it's not just that the audience knows the difference, the actor knows the difference. And if the actor can really use those tools and, and, and knows that this is really how you do it and I've become a master of how you really do it, his belief in himself is huge. And it affects how he picks up a coffee cup. It affects how he talks to his wife. It affects how he walks in the door, how he takes off his jacket. The activity will have a truth-telling style that they just can't, you know, that's just so communicative and powerful. You know, it affects them in a myriad of ways when they truly believe, you know, as Jimmy Kahn correctly did, that I can open up a safe. You know, I do know how to do this thing. There's also a kind of heightened self-awareness that Frank has. He, he, in a scene that's often talked about, the scene in the diner yeah. between Frank and Jesse, he, he kind of, in this very beautiful monologue, lays out his whole life for her, where yeah. he's come from, where he is and where he wants to go, and, and it's all very clear to him. That probably comes from uh, experiences in Folsom. Folsom was not anything like I thought it was going to be. I thought I would experience an overbearing presence of guards and convicts who were feeling that oppression. And it was the exact inverse of that. The convicts were alive and um, uh, kind of flamboyant in language and dress and tattoos. And I realized that these were very aggressive type A personalities 
that they asked themselves very fundamental questions when they got long sentences, like, how should I view the rest of my time? How should I view the rest of my life? Why don't I just commit suicide right now and get this over with? If this is a misery. And if I'm going to live, why am I living? Why am I alive? What's my existence? And these are guys with sixth, seventh grade educations. And they're walking in a library and say, hey, you, the librarian, give me a book about some philosophy or something. Tell me, who's, who's writing about why, why you should stay alive? And five, six years later, these guys are autodidactic, they're self-educated, they're, they're, they're very, very sophisticated, and this is, not, and this is not um, a philosophical approach to one's life that is an academic pursuit or because or, or it's a hobby. They sought information to understand, to try and figure out for themselves what should my view of life be, because I need to know. And so I imagine Frank in prison asking himself these questions. That's why he's self-conscious, not self-conscious in terms of being embarrassed or shy, but, but consciously aware. So I, I want to I ask, uh, you know, about the sound of Thief, yeah. the original music of Tangerine Dream. This was only their second film score after Sorcerer. Right. How did you come to know their music and decide that that would be the sound of this film? That was very difficult, and, that, and that I'm, not, I'm still not 100% certain I made the right decision. I grew up around uh, jazz on the south side, and particularly blues. And I loved blues, and that was going to be the score. And then uh, I heard Tangerine Dream's first album, and I was attracted to that. And it, there's a certain similarity in that Edgar Froyce had first played 12-bar blues. Edgar Force was the, one of the, the three guys in Tangerine Dream. So I, I, it's a debate going on within me about, you know, it was, it was kind of one of those, um, my natural intuitive inclination is towards blues and, um, you know, my more programmatic kind of formalist approach is that the film will benefit from the abstraction of electronic score and the themes will emerge through it better. Hit it, hit it, he's moving. Because the kind of specificity, the ethnic specificity, the racial specificity of blues grounds you into the earthiness of it, and that's not good. For, so I had this debate with myself when I, I was bored the hell out of my wife and went on endlessly, and uh, I decided to go to Tangerine Dream. You chose a, 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 a cameraman, Donald Thorne. This was his first movie. Uh, Don Thorne was the gaffer on Jericho Mile, and I really hit it off with him. He had a certain empathy for how I wanted to use light. And in Thief, it was going to be very, very specific, how I wanted things lit. I approach filmmaking from the point of view that the director, you know, got his eye through the camera, and he sets the shot and composes the frame and the director of photography lights with lights. That's what they do. That was not the standard operating procedure in uh, cinema in the U.S. in 1980. The cameraman would compose the shots, and the director would tell the actors what to do. That was the classical Hollywood way of working, and I never worked that way. I mean, I come from a European perspective. I wanted to ask about the casting and whether yeah. you wrote the script with any of the actors in mind, Tuesday Welder, James Kahn, or Robert Prosky, or any of these really special performances, how, how these people ended up making their way into the film. No, I didn't write it with anybody in mind. I, I've never done that. Leo was a combination of two organized crime figures in Chicago, Milwaukee, Phil Alderizio, and Leo Rugendorf. Alderizio was, was uh, a particularly vicious guy behind the facade of uh, kind of benevolent paternalism. And then trying to find somebody to play Leo was really hard because I must have I must have interviewed and auditioned 70, 80 uh, actors in New York. Jerry Bruckheimer and myself we were casting in New York, and I got to one point and I remember saying to Jerry, "Look, am I thinking about this the wrong way? Because I can't have seen 70, 80 actors, and I don't like any of them. They all feel like cliches, or you know, seen it on television or something." And uh, am I thinking about the character the wrong way? I have the wrong set of do I have the wrong set of criteria? I'm trying to apply to this, you know. And he gave me some of the best advice in my career. He said, you know, no, you're not. Don't sweat it. You know, the right guy hasn't walked in the room yet. 
you'll know it when he does. I've seen you with casting and when you know it. And then sure enough, Robert Prosky came in and he had uh, never done a film before. He was uh, the lead actor at the Arena Theater in Washington. And, uh, you know, he came in and, and, you know, after four lines of dialogue, this is a guy who's a vuncular and heavy duty. You one of those burned out, demolished wackos in the joint? You're scary because you don't give a fuck. But don't come on to me now with your jailhouse bullshit because you are not that guy. Don't you get it, you prick? You got a home, car, businesses, family, and I own a paper on your whole fucking life. It was, it was perfect. And you hadn't seen him, and he was fresh. Well, what about Tuesday? Let's go to Tuesday. Tuesday she has was, really I was special. in love with Tuesday Weld when I was 15 years old, like everybody else in my generation. Dobie Gillis. Yeah, Dobie Gillis, I mean, Tuesday Weld, you know. So the idea of, uh, of her was really appealing, and she had that uh, kind of China doll, you know, presence. But she's been places. She's seen things, you know, she's had experiences, not all good. She really could convey that. She had a certain kind of lusty worldliness about her, and it was charming to see some of the byplay between Tuesday and, and Jimmy Khan. I was alone. I had no money, no clothes, no visa, standing on the corner of Bogota and Colombia. Things did happen. Where were you in prison? Would you pass a cream, please? So we had the war. Whoa, God. Hey. Can we some uh, new cream here? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? It's cottage cheese. And James Conn, in this movie, he, he, he really, he seems transformed somehow. Um, physically, his energy, yeah. he's such, he, he seems kind of primed to explode from yeah. the minute we first see him. And it's just the way he, way he moves through a scene. I thought he was a great actor. But it was uh, James Conn, the man, who, you know, uh, that kind of credentialed him to really do Frank. You know, uh, very, very, he had very strong feelings. Uh, he is kinetic. He has that energy. That's who he is. That's who he is. You want to put down contract scores all over the country, working directly for me? I am self-employed. I am doing fine. I don't deal with egos. I am Joe the boss of my own body, so what the fuck do I have to work for you for? From a, uh, from a technical perspective, how difficult was it to do the scene in which um, Frank uh, cuts the door in the big vault with that magnesium rod? Right. I mean, it looks like the whole set might the, the, catch fire at any minute. The burning bar, yeah. It was difficult. We had to, we had to uh, you know, we did it on a stage at Zoetrope, when, this is when Coppola owned Zoetrope. And, um, you know, we had a real vault door and we had a real burning bar and we cut the thing in half, you know. You'd have all the problems that they would have if you walked into a wholesale diamond merchant and cut his safe in half with a burning bar, you know. You'd have fire extinguishers and the same stuff that they did. So, on one hand it was difficult and on the other hand it really wasn't. It would have been more difficult to not have a real safe door. That thing heats up to about 4,000 degrees and, uh, you know, so it has to be cutting metal. I wanted to ask about a couple of significant changes in the film from what I believe is the shooting draft of the, the script. One <clears throat> is that um, we see Frank's wife in that version of the script and also a child that he has with her, right. w which is absent from the, the film. And also the ending is different. In the, in the script, at the end, we see, we see Frank and Jesse uh, reunited uh, wherever it is that right. he's gone to hide out. Why did you decide to make those changes? It made sense for to see that he had tried to put together his his uh, ideal idealization of what his life ought to be, and that the first time he tried to put it together it didn't work. He doesn't give up. He's tenacious, and he goes about a second time. They had a certain kind of logic in writing. When it was on film. It didn't. It was a digression. It became unnecessary. I don't know, I just felt that was better just seeing Frank putting it together in the present. And then I was of, um, I was of two minds about the ending. And I actually shot something that could indicate that he gets together with Tuesday again. And it felt like a cop-out.
the tougher kind of grim ending and it was a definitely a very grim ending for 1980 1981 if you take a look at other films that are coming out about that time films didn't end this way so oh, man, man this is the rest of his life you know <laughs> um, but it was authentic you know and it was, and it was authentic to the um, you know to the starting point and to the ideas I was interested in the way he survived in prison the kind of Darwinian adaptations that were successful in prison was when he didn't care about himself at all anymore, when he reduced himself to some abject state of, uh, of caring about nothing. Now he's acquired things that have meaning to him. Leo has seduced him with a kind of paternalism that he had from Okla, but that's within the capitalist paradigm. I'm allowed to exploit you and I'll appropriate some of the yield of your risk and your labor. And uh, the only way out for somebody who has constructed his life so um, in such a limited mechanical way is for him to, n n because what's being jeopardized are the things he cares about, is to not have things he cares about. So he evicts uh, Jesse from, and his child from his life. He burns down the house, he burns down the bar, he, burn, he burns down rocket cars. And now there's nothing. Now he's back to that state of nothingness. He then has the capacity to, to act against Leo. But there was, ironically, free liberation in that, a very grim kind of liberation. I know that you're not a big fan of the label modernism. It feels, uh, especially looking back on it now, yeah. like a movie that, that really had a lot of influence, not, not just on things you did subsequently, right. but on a lot of other movies, a kind of very distinctly 80s sort of combination right. of a certain look, lighting-wise, the electronic music, a, a certain heightened reality. I would describe Thief as a modernist picture not because of how it uses cinematics, but because of its the nature of of because of the narrative, because of the story. It is it has a a uh, you know an idea at its core, and that determines the structure. And it is designed to have you um, leave the film, or the film leaves you with um, very specific ideas, and it's designed to affect the way you think. That's a classical 20th century modernist notion. You know, I, I, would, I would not engage in something like that now. You know, but did, did I want to change the way you thought about things? Yes. That was, that was some of the motive going into, into Thief.